This is a talk on a, a different method of eating. It's not a new diet. I know that most people, when they hear about another diet, it just upsets their stomach. They've heard about so many diets. But this is a way of eating that any diet can be adjusted to. And the bottom line that I'll be describing is the great benefits of not eating whatever carbohydrates you're going to eat during the day over different parts of the day, but concentrating them in one of the meals of the day. That's, the, that's telling you what I'm going to be telling you, and ex I'm going to explain the reasons for it. Um, it's, uh, the way I'm going to go forward is to describe my own experience, how I fell into this diet, what I learned about, and what I'm trying to do with the help of a scientist uh, colleague whom I'll introduce shortly. We're uh, basically trying to change the way the world eats in order to do something about the epidemic of obesity and the epidemic of degenerative disease and the health budget crisis. Uh, something has to be done about these terrible things. And we consider this to be a simple and practical way to deal with those problems. And uh, we're going to explain why this fits, not only with uh, the experience of a very popular diet that sold five million books, but also fits with 80 years of scientific experimentation uh, in which they showed that if you starved animals of all different species, uh, they lived longer and healthier. So for starters, let me say something about what carbohydrates are. The high sugar carbohydrates are the white stuff, sugar, bread, potatoes. Intermediate uh, in their degree of carbohydrate are brown rice, uh, raisins, apples, orange, banana, these things down here, vegetables, really. And least are steak and cheese and fish. What we're about to suggest is that you eat the high glycemic carbs, we'll talk more about what that means later, uh, at one of the three meals you have, and at the other two meals, eat things that have less carbohydrate, veggies, salad, and protein. I got started in thinking about this when I was very overweight. I was on the borderline of obese and overweight when an article was published in the New York Times called, What If It's All a Big Fat Lie? This article was about the low-fat diet that was so popular. And uh, it was written by a very courageous science reporter who had won many awards, Gary Taubes. And he had had the courage to write an article and the bizazz to persuade the New York Times to publish it, saying that the whole thing was wrong and had been known to be wrong for a very long time. In 1867, this man, Banting, on the left, had weighed 201 pounds. He was a short man, and he was afflicted with every possible disease. He had hard of hearing, uh, uh, all kinds of health problems, and children made fun of him in the street. And uh, he went to a lot of different doctors. None of them could help him. He went to one doctor who later became quite famous, and the doctor told him, eat kippers for breakfast, which are fish, and put him on what would, you would now know as a low-carb diet. And uh, this man uh, began losing a pound a week. And after a year, he had lost 50 pounds. And he weighed only 150 pounds instead of 200. His health had completely returned. He wrote a book about it. He was very grateful to the doctor. He wrote a very enthusiastic book. And all of uh, Britain started banting. They called it banting. His name was Banting. And they started doing this diet, which they called banting, uh, spread like wildfire. And for about 150 years later, uh, all the medical textbooks said, if you want to lose weight, eat protein. They didn't say, uh, eat a low-fat diet. They said, eat protein. And uh, this man, Robert Atkins, picked this up in the 60s and started uh, merchandising the idea of a low-carb diet. So when I saw this article, what if it's all a big fat lie, I was very overweight. I said to my wife, BJ, we got to jump on this. And we both uh, uh, started the Atkins diet. And I lost, in a few months, I lost 30 pounds. And I felt a lot better. But after, um, after about nine years, I started to gain some of it back. A doctor said to me, you're gaining weight. You should do something. I didn't want to go back on the Atkins diet. And uh, 
can't remember exactly why, but it's, a, it's some work to get back onto it. But a friend of mine had said, well, if you, I skipped dinner to keep my weight in check, so I decided to try that. So I skipped dinner, and I found that wasn't too difficult. I started eating one big meal and having a snack at dinner, like a salad, and then I wasn't very hungry at breakfast. So pretty soon I was eating just one meal a day. And uh, at, at this point, um, I was losing weight. I lost my, some of my allergies. I didn't know why. I regained my sense of smell, and things were going pretty well. And then I remembered two things. Uh, one of these things you probably know, but one of these things you probably don't know. The thing you probably know is that in the 1930s, they realized that if you um, uh, starved rats and gave them 30% less calories than they normally would eat, that they would live 30% longer and much healthier. And indeed, if you starved them 40%, they lived even longer and healthier. And up to the point where they started starving, they did better on less food. So caloric restriction, so-called, was very popular with the scientists. Thousands of articles have now been written on caloric restriction, uh, not just on uh, mice, but all manner of species. And it always worked. But they didn't know exactly why it worked. But I knew something more about this than what I just told you. I knew that you didn't have to starve the rats to get them to live healthier. You could feed them every other day. And when you fed them every other day, they often ate more calories than they would otherwise. They often uh, ate so much on the day they were permitted to eat that they uh, had eaten net more calories than they would have otherwise. So I called up a Harvard professor of medicine that I knew who was a kind of mentor for me, and I said, uh, Ben, uh, look, um, I'm not star eating one day and starving the next, but I am going from one big meal at lunch to another big meal at lunch. And as a consequence, if you calculate how many hours of low glucose and low insulin I get each day, it's the same as these rats on intermittent fasting got. I'm getting about 19 hours of low insulin and low glucose because when you don't eat the carbs, you don't get the glucose that's produced by the carbs and you don't get the insulin that comes out in response to the glucose. So most of the day you've got low glucose and low insulin and then it goes up when you eat the meal with the carbs, which was usually my lunch, but sometimes my dinner. It would go up, come down, and then it would be flat again. The glucose and insulin would be flat again. So for 19 hours a day, I had low glucose and low insulin. And every two days, 19 times two, well, it's 38, and that was what the rats were getting on their two-day fast. They were getting 38 hours of low insulin and low glucose. Of course, they were getting it all at one time in one long stretch. I was getting it during most of the day and then most of the next day. But it was the same number of hours. So I said to this professor, retired Harvard professor, uh, will I get the benefits these uh, rats got? And he said, I think you will. So I got really excited about that because that was the touchstone of what the scientists knew about longevity. So um, I, uh, that was Ben Treadwell who said, I think you will. I have to hit two buttons here so I may occasionally forget to hit one of them. So I uh, started looking around for other people that uh, shared my views. And I ran into Dr. Bert Herring, who was the inventor of a similar diet. His diet was you could eat anything you wanted during five hours, but during 19 hours, you were supposed to not eat at all. He called it fast five. It really meant fast 19 hours. But for reasons of alliteration, he called it fast five. He was a medical doctor and served in the Navy. And he'd worked at the National Cancer Institute, where my wife worked for 36 years. And he built this website, and he had hundreds of followers who were doing this, and they were very happy with it. He told me that many of them had come to it themselves and then were confirmed in this idea by his uh, diet. So I began working with him, and we wrote a paper, and we went to Portland, Oregon, to the annual meeting of the American Aging Association. This is where the greatest experts in biochemistry and uh, uh, nutritional medicine and longevity and aging were. And uh, so they knew far more than I did. But I rented a room and said, I'd like to hold a seminar. And I invited the leaders of the conference to come. And uh, uh, there they are in this seminar. That's me there. And uh, that's uh, Bert Herring there. 
This is a former president of the American Aging Association. Uh, this is a very famous uh, a man who has written a book on how you might be able to have people live forever. And, uh, and this is the Harvard professor of medicine. And there were other, about 17 others in the room, uh, leaders of the conference. And uh, so I said, look, uh, Herring and I, we're going to propose a low insulin diet. Anybody going to object to a low insulin diet among you experts? And I'd been asking this at the conference, and nobody had any objections. We began talking about what I was planning to do, and everybody seemed fine with it. There was some dispute. I happened to know the article that somebody raised happily, and so I was able to put down one objection. And in the end, we survived the gauntlet here. And, uh, uh, but on return, I uh, talked to uh, uh, Bert about uh, this. We were going to write a book on it. We decided not to write the book, and I began to have second thoughts about whether I could get everybody in the world uh, to jump on a diet that I was on, which was basically one meal a day. The doctors were certain to say, this is meal skipping, and we don't hold with meal skipping. And if the doctors didn't hold with the diet, then you couldn't get people to stick to it. Even if they saw it on Oprah's show, they would soon decide you know, to give it up because uh, their doctor hadn't agreed to it. So I, I started looking at diets that uh, people had proposed to see if there was some diet that I could live with that I could sell to the world at large. And uh, I decided one meal a day couldn't be sold to doctors, but I found this carbohydrate addicts diet. Now these two people, the Herrings, had the, the Hellers, um, they had been obese in their 30s. Uh, Mrs. Heller had weighed 300 pounds. They had terrible problems with overweight. And uh, Mrs. Herring was once told by her doctor, the trouble is you eat like a pig. She burst into tears. She had been struggling to do something about her weight, tried everything. She wasn't just you know, indulging herself, but she was addicted. And she knew she was addicted. One day she found a cure for this by accident. She was asked to take an MRI. And the MRI, uh, required that she go without food for 12 hours. So she thought this is going to be really difficult. But she bought some donuts to take with her so that immediately after the MRI she could eat these donuts. And uh, uh, after the MRI she discovered that she was able to resist eating the donuts. Going without food for 12 hours, keeping her insulin and glucose low for 12 hours had changed the whole picture. Her appetite had been induced by her glucose and, sh and insulin going up and down all the time, which incites the appetite. 12 hours off had uh, done something very important. So she and her husband, they're both Dr. Herrings, uh, they developed a carbohydrate addict's diet. They concluded that um, uh, they, they concluded that 75% of all the people that were overweight and many of normal weight were in fact carbohydrate addicts like uh, drug addicts or alcohol addicts and they had a very hard time. They had an intense, compelling, recurring and gripping hunger and craving for foods rich in carbohydrate, primarily foods composed of simple refined sugar. And they thought this addiction was similar to addictions to alcohol and drugs in that it increased over time. The more they did it, the more it, it stuck they were. And. Uh, they observed, it was very interesting to me, that most of the people that they got on this carbohydrate addicts diet, they sold this as a diet for carbohydrate addicts. Most of the, they, they think they cured about 80% of the people that were carbohydrate addicts, and they thought that was about 75% of all the people. And uh, they said most of these carbohydrate addicts uh, settled on one or two meals. That is, during the period that they weren't eating carbs, they didn't have enough appetite, and they ended up much like me, with sort of one big meal and a salad or some snack, and they were pretty well on low glucose and insulin the whole day, and not much in the way of calories on those other periods either. So this was a, a very significant thing. Um, they, their idea was this, you see, their idea was if the the glucose would have to go down low enough so the insulin would go down to this insulin activity threshold before your body would feel that it needed energy from its fat and before it would go to the uh, fat cells for energy. So long as the insulin uh, was high, 
And this is a graph of insulin here. So long as the insulin was high, uh, you weren't going to lose any weight. And the fat cells were not going to feel they were needed. So with the people who were, no, uh, were addicts, the obese especially, they had a body that did this. The insulin would go up at breakfast and come down, but it wouldn't get down far enough to get to this threshold where your cells would go to the fat to get some energy. And then it would become time for lunch and the insulin would go up at lunch and then it would come down, then it'd be time for dinner, and then there'd be time for a snack. And throughout the whole day, the insulin levels were staying very high. This is very bad for the people, but it also meant they weren't gonna lose any weight that way. Now, even the normal people who are on this smaller scale, you see this smaller scale here? They came down to the insulin activity threshold where you could get some energy from your fat cells and therefore deplete some of the fat cells, but not very often. And that was the lean group. So, um, so that was their idea. And uh, I found it very attractive because they were not advocating that you eat one meal a day. They said a lot of people went down to eating one main meal and stuff, but they weren't advocating one meal a day. They were advocating three meals a day. So I thought, well, the, this passes the doctor's smell test. You know, at least the doctors will not object and say this is one of those darn uh, meal-skipping uh, uh, diets. And so, um, so basically they said eat the carbs once and one hour. Uh, parking at the lunch or dinner. Don't eat it over five hours, like Herring was talking about. And uh, in their experience then, it wasn't how many carbs you ate. This is very important now, focus on this. It wasn't how many carbs you ate. It was on the frequency with which you ate the carbs and the duration during which you ate the carbs. Because the whole question was how to control your insulin. And according to them, the insulin came out in two waves. First, if you were about to sit down to lunch, some insulin popped out in proportion to your last meal in anticipation that you might need this much insulin to deal with the sugar from this next meal because it remembered, the body remembered the last meal. Then you would eat and later another wave of insulin would come out saying, well, considering how much he ate and how much insulin we gave him before, he's gonna need some supplemental insulin. So there were two waves of this insulin. So they felt if you only ate the insulin, only ate the carbs for one hour, then uh, you could control these two waves. And if you hadn't eaten a lot of carbs in the previous meal, then the insulin in the first wave wouldn't be so great. So this was their idea about the way things were working. And uh, the insulin release was overreacting to the blood sugar. And they also said that serotonin was signaling, say uh, you're having enough to eat, satiety and uh, that these serotonin signals didn't go off appropriately if you were eating carbs too often during the day. And furthermore, the carbs were not uh, satisfying the addicts. You know, the more the addicts ate these carbs, the more they wandered off to pastry stores and stuffed, stuffed pastries down their mouth so fast they didn't even savor them. These were people really addicted. They would have walked a mile over to Jimbo's to get the pastry, you know, out of control, addicts, the way people did it for drinks or drugs. And, uh, and so the subsidiary meals were supposed to be what's called low glycemic veggies and protein, cheese, bean, salad. High glycemic means that if you look at your blood glucose, which is measured on this axis, the high glycemic were producing rapid rises in uh, uh, glucose and blood sugar, and then they would drop. And under this tent, this area would measure how glycemic, how full of carbohydrates the thing you were eating was, if it was low glycemic, your blood sugar wouldn't rise so rapidly and it, and it would come down more slowly. It wasn't such a shock to the system. So that's why the subsidiary meals were supposed to be of, uh, of low glycemic veggies, protein, cheese, beans, and salad. So that was the idea the addicts had. And of course, if you think about what was happening with hunter-gatherers, they were not eating three squares a day full of carbohydrates. There was not a lot of sugar and uh, fruit around. They were eating whenever they could get food and, uh, and they were all often uh, fasting for long periods when they couldn't get food. We'll be talking more about this later. So the idea that the, uh, that the uh, herrings had, had some strength in history. Now, at this point, I wrote an article called Concentrate Your Carbs. 
And I tried to link the diet that the carbs had produced for carbohydrate addicts, this diet of eating your carbs just in one meal of the day and not eating them with three meals. I tried to link this to 80 years of very powerful scientific research. In fact, when I was at that meeting in Portland, Oregon of the American Aging Association, I said to these leading experts, I said, you have 80 years of very cohesive and comprehensive research showing that caloric restriction works on every species you've ever tried it on and improves their health and makes them live longer. Everything from yeast to fungus to rats and spiders and mice and you name it, and primates. And, uh, and you'll see humans. It, it worked really well. I said, why aren't you telling the world about it? Well, they were scientists, you know. They said, well, not our job. Well, you know, I was president of the Federation of American Scientists for 30 years, so I knew what the scientists were like. They were busy doing their research and trying to get grants. And if they were trying to sell proposals, they wouldn't get grants. These grants are given out by peer review committees. And if you do anything that's uh, slightly revolutionary or unorthodox, you don't get any more grants. So, so they said, you're an activist, you know, you, 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 you do it if you want. So anyway, I wrote this paper saying the Hellers weren't just right, but they were backed up by 80 years of scientific research. So then I, I needed help on this because I am a mere mathematician, not a scientist. And uh, so I was doing some more research and I came across a local scientist, a real scientist, Mark McCarty. Mark McCarty had written about the Bahadori mini fast with exercise. And uh, I lured him up here to lunch and we began working together. Mark, you want to stand up and take a bow? This is Mark McCarty. And uh, uh, M Mark has written more articles for the Journal of Medical Hypotheses than any other scientist. So he's full of ideas and he's very well informed on the literature and a very great researcher. So for nutritional medicine, biochemistry, gerontology. He's one of the great uh, world experts. And so I've got an enormous help from him. And uh, much of this lecture is due to his mentoring and uh, teaching. Now, the Bahadori mini fast with exercise was a, a combination of his thinking and a man named Bahadori. Now, Bahadori was an Iranian. And from my point of view, this Bahadori mini fast with exercise, what it amounted to is the Ramadan feast diet with exercise. Because at Ramadan, they ate at dusk, you remember, and then for 30 days, they didn't eat during the day, and then they ate, actually pigged out as soon as the sun went down. Uh, this is an example of the Muslims eating after the 12-hour fast. And the articles that Mark found and that I had already found some of, they all show that people were healthier after this Ramadan thing, after this uh, mere 12 hours of low glucose and low insulin. Whereas, of course, my concentrate your carbs diet was giving you 19 hours of low carbs and low insulin. They were only doing it for 12 hours, but their blood parameters were better and they were healthier. So, um, so this was very important. And uh, just about the time Mark and I had constructed the website, which you can now find on the web, uh, the Israelis produced a paper. This is the Hebrew University and this is a key Israeli scientist. And they had actually confirmed the Heller's idea that the frequency of eating carbohydrates was more important than how many carbohydrates you ate. They took overweight policemen who had a BMI of 30, that's the borderline between healthy and uh, overweight, and they had half of them eat uh, the same number of calories as the other half, but one half ate all their carbs at dinner, and the other half ate their carbs in three parts at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The ones that ate their carbs only at dinner did better. They had better blood indicators, they lost more weight, they were in every way healthier. The Hellers had done this same experiment, but they hadn't published it, they hadn't done it in a scientific way. It takes a lot of money and trouble to do this in a controlled way. But these guys had done a first class article and Mark found it in PubMed. And we were very uh, enthused by this because it was really a confirmation of, uh, of what the uh, Hellers thought. Now, uh, so far, I'm, I'm not yet at the stage of what the scientists add to all this. I'm just uh, going to um, say something about uh, what you get just from doing this concentrate your carbs thing. Uh, this man is uh, Gerald Raven of Stanford, 
who wrote the basic book on metabolic syndrome, and he showed there was a very strong connection between a lot of things going wrong in people's bodies. And, uh, and it, it led to insulin resistance, it led to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and, uh, and if you didn't eat so many carbs, you had better insulin sensitivity, better responses to the blood sugar without exaggerated amounts of insulin coming out. The whole body got tuned up better, and you got lower inflammation. And uh, it was very important to get leanness. It was very important to get leanness for metabolic syndrome. You see, the carb concentration in, will induce leanness because everybody on this diet that the Hellers were selling, I, I maybe forgot to emphasize this, they lost weight. They lost weight. These carb addicts, they lost weight. And the single most important thing you can do for your health is to lose weight. Uh, Walter Willits, the great expert at Harvard, has said that. And uh, the more we study about this, the more this becomes clear. And so the great benefit that the Hellers had done for the carbohydrate addicts was to teach them how to control their addiction, but that wasn't just to save money. That was to get them to lose weight. If they were going to eat carbs three times a day, they were going to have high glucose and high insulin, and the fat would never go away because, as I mentioned before, they would never get below the low insulin threshold that told the body, hey, you're hungry, better use some of the fat. So, so people got lean on the Heller diet, and it was very good for this metabolic syndrome. It helped the heart, it helped the brain, it helped the blood pressure, all the things that uh, Raven had taught about metabolic syndrome were improved. Now that wasn't the only thing it helped. Uh, this carb concentration, this CC means carb concentration, this carb concentration eating slows cancer spread. It does it in three ways. It slows the proliferation of precancerous cells. That's one thing. It slows the rate of mutations that produce the cancers. And it, um, and it promotes the organized death of precancerous cells through apoptosis. I mean, cells that get cancerous should be destroying themselves, and this diet helps them do that so rather than hang on and stay on and breed more cancers. So, so, so far what I've told you is the Heller diet, it's good for cancer, it's good for heart disease, it's good for stroke, it's good for diabetes. It was a really great thing. Now, if you I do have diabetes, and uh, as I mentioned before at the outset, I think I mentioned before, I'm not a doctor, you have to consult your doctor before doing this, especially people here have many obscure conditions, and uh, we can't be responsible for all of them, and if something goes wrong with you that has nothing to do with our diet, we can't afford to pay for that either. So, you have to consult with your doctor. Now, diabetics especially should, because the doctors have not been all agreed on just what you're supposed to do with diabetes anyway, they have different ideas about it, and they've changed their ideas over recent decades. But in looking into this, Mark and I made a special effort to look into what this would mean for people who are diabetic or pre-diabetic. A couple of things can be said about this. Uh, one of them is that, uh, first of all, Mrs. Heller, who, as I mentioned, was 300 pounds in her 30s, people that obese, they're all diabetic or pre-diabetic. And uh, she uh, did well on the diet. She wrote, if you have adult, uh, this doesn't work for people of type 1 diabetes, you know, the type you get as a child. There are a few of them here in La Costa Glen, but not many. But for the adult onset diabetes, type 2 diabetes, this diet can quickly reduce both insulin levels and insulin resistance. It can rapidly and drastically reduce or eliminate your need for injectable medications. But this is another reason why it's got to be worked out with your doctor. But the Hellers, who had much clinical experience, I mean, they set up a clinic, and they did this for years. They sold five million copies of their book. They rewrote the book every five years and put it out in a different way, and they went on Oprah's show many times, and they had many different patients. So uh, they, um, they weren't worried about the insulin surges that would result from the one meal that had all the carbohydrates. But if your doctor was worried about that, you could just eat less carbohydrates. You know, you don't have to eat a lot of carbohydrates on the one meal where you're permitted to have carbohydrates. And it's not supposed to be a meal of only carbohydrates. It's just supposed to be the meal where you do eat whatever carbohydrates you're going to eat. So you can keep the insulin surge down as much as you want. 
And when we looked into diabetics in the Arab, Arab world, because after all, there are a lot of Muslims with diabetes, we found that uh, with counseling, they, they do all uh, observe Ramadan. And don't forget, Ramadan, you're having tremendous surges because for 12 hours, they don't eat at all. And then they're encouraged to pig out afterwards because it's a feast. You know, I mean, they're celebrating Ramadan. So, and they eat like crazy because they know they're not going to be able to eat the next day. So they're doing this for 30 days. So they definitely have these insulin surges. And what we read uh, is that compliant, well-controlled type 2 diabetics did observe Ramadan fasting. It wasn't recommended for type 1 or for non-compliant, poorly controlled uh, diabetics or for pregnant diabetics. So for the most of all, the, the Ramadan people uh, were able to live with it. Now, uh, so that's what the Hellers produced. Now, these are a lot of healthy advantages just from what the Hellers learned about this. Now I want to add to it what Mark and I believe further supports this diet through a thousand scientific papers on caloric restriction. And we're going to teach you how this is really caloric restriction without caloric restriction. You don't have to sit in a cage and be told you're going to have 30% less food today and tomorrow and the next day to get the benefits of caloric restriction if we're right. So this is the important part that we're trying to add to what the Hellers did. So the question is, is carb concentrated eating a practical way to get a degree, that means a measure, of the benefits of caloric restriction? CR means caloric restriction. CC means carbohydrate concentration. And can you not only get a degree of the benefits of caloric restriction, but some of those benefits you'll see even involve slowing aging. So we're going to talk about that more. And this is our website here, you see. And this is the plot of glucose and insulin being low. Then there's the one meal, glucose and insulin go up, and then it comes down. And then for the rest of the day, it's low. So for these 24 hours, except for four hours, on the carb concentration diet, you have a low insulin diet. And we're arguing this is a practical way to limit weight and reduce risks of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and dementia, which of course is a major, major concern. Now, in 1986, a great researcher in this, Richard Weindrich, he reported that restricting the caloric intake on mice proportionally increased lifespan, that I mentioned to you before, and also delayed age-restricted diets, like degenerative diseases, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, things like that. On the mice, everything went well. But in addition, they maintained a more youthful appearance. That's what we mean by slowing aging. They looked younger. This is, uh, this is two primates in an experiment that's only been going on for 20 years. They're not even dead yet. But the rate of degenerative disease has dropped by two-thirds, two-thirds. And you see, this one looks better, and this one looks worse. And so they have, uh, they have low, and, and by the way, they're given a terrible diet. For some reason, the scientists have given them a very bad diet. But anyway, uh, and that may be one of the reasons they've reduced the risks by so much. The control group has such a bad diet, Mark. Uh, anyway, they also have improved uh, appearances. And this experiment's not over yet. These uh, primates are only 20 years old now. So uh, this may have even uh, uh, better results later. Now, uh, in order to figure out where we stood on this, I began to read review articles even before I met Mark to write my paper, Concentrate Your Carbs. This man, Spindler, Stephen Spindler, he, he lives up in Riverdale. And uh, I went to see him because he'd written a review article on 900 articles on caloric restriction. You know what I mean? I couldn't understand the articles, which were deeply scientific. But I could understand the review article, which summarized everything they were saying. And he had said, in the, among the things he said in this review article was that studies in humans showed that caloric restriction produced many of the same benefits that were produced in species which experience lifespan extension. In other words, he said the same physiologic, hematologic, hormonal, and biochemical changes produced in all these species that I told you lived longer in caloric restriction. The humans that went to caloric restriction, they were, in fact, getting the same kind of benefits. And uh, they were also getting uh, protection from type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular and cerebral vascular disease, age-related immunological decline, uh, malignancy, liver diseases like hepatic, hepa, 
toe toxicity, liver fibrosis and failure, system systemic inflammation, and DNA damage. And another recent paper he had showed that caloric restriction improved memory in elderly humans. So if you all don't remember anything else of this lecture except that caloric restriction will improve your memory, please make a note of that. So, so the first thing I learned in this uh, review article was caloric restriction was really a good thing for people. There was only one problem. People didn't want to do it. Uh, and uh, this is a man on, you know, 30% caloric restriction. He's very gaunt. My wife and I went to a, uh, went to a uh, conference on longevity on the island of Crete about 10 years ago. And all these great experts on longevity were there. And one of the guys on, that had started this uh, caloric restriction society for humans was there too. And he looked very gaunt. And I thought, you know, this is not going to spread very widely. I also asked uh, one of the scientists there, I said, uh, how do you know how old a person is? Oh, he said, I, I mean, uh, how do you measure their biological age? Not their chronological age, but their biological age. He said, oh, he said, uh, we, we've had the biometric wars. We fought with each other for 10 years trying to figure out what was a good measure of how old a person really was biologically. And we never could come up with an answer. He said the best thing we could come up with was to look at their face. So the scientific community doesn't yet, hasn't yet figured out how to measure your biological age. Uh, but if you look like you're younger, they think you probably are biologically younger. And uh, so that was an interesting thing. But in any case, uh, we did learn that uh, caloric restriction in the traditional way, it was very hard for people to do. Now, this man, Matson, one of the greatest experts in the country at the National Institute of Health, he had also written a great review article a few years later, reviewing all these articles. And uh, he knew that intermittent fasting, see, IF means intermittent fasting. That's eating every other day. He knew that fasting every other day showed results quite similar to caloric restriction. In other words, he knew what I had known when I said to the Harvard professor, am I going to get the benefits the rats did? I'm not doing caloric restriction and I'm not eating every other day, but I'm going from one big meal to another big meal. Will I, is this a form of intermittent fasting? Will I get these caloric restriction experiments? And Matson uh, wrote an article saying that the blood indicators for intermittent fasting and caloric restriction were extremely similar. What it did to insulin, triglycerides, LDL, cholesterol, high density, HDL cholesterol, and ketones were amazingly similar. The effects on blood pressure, heart rate, insulin sensitivity, and lipid accumulation, very similar. The brain results on cognition and motor function, very similar. In some, caloric restriction, which was so hard for humans to do, and intermittent fasting, which was eating every other day, we're getting the same results, improving the same biomarkers, and producing almost, uh, improving almost precisely the same biomarkers. And Matson also said that, in, interestingly, increasing the time interval between meals can have beneficial effects on the brain and overall health of mice that's independent of how many calories you're eating. In other words, he was on track for something I was trying to advance, that it wasn't how many calories you're eating. It wasn't even how many carbs you were eating. It was how often you were eating the carbs. You see, that had a lot to do with the blood indicators. It also had a lot to do with the appetite. And the appetite had a lot to do with how many calories you were eating. So, so the, uh, uh, the ideas of uh, Matson were very important to Mark and myself. And we had found a book called The Alternate Day Diet. Two doctors had written a splendid scientific book, which I read before I got here, actually, before I met Mark. And uh, they had shown that intermittent fasting had a lot of great results. Uh, and they had some people doing it. They didn't have them eating all they wanted one day and nothing the next. They decided that was too much. So they said 500 calories the next day is what we'll try. And uh, so they were eating all they wanted and then a mere 500 calories, like one shake drink, you know. And uh, the trouble was, uh, that didn't seem too practical either, because 
you know, imagine if you were trying it, eating all you wanted one day, you know, which day is this? And now, well, yesterday I ate all I want, so this day I'm only eating 500 calories. And socially it has some problems, if, like if you want to eat dinner or lunch with your friends at La Costa Glen. So we didn't think that was too practical either. Now, the question that comes to mind in the research we're doing is, is it really all about calories? Is it really all about carbs? Or is it really all about insulin? Was the role of the carbs, the controlling of the calories in the restriction of food to the rats, was it really to keep their insulin low for a long time? Or was it the calorie themselves? If you restrict the calories, you're going to get low insulin. So which was doing it? Was it the low calories themselves? Or were they doing it through low insulin? Because Mark and I are producing a low insulin diet without inflicting a lot of damage on our calorie eating, you know, and without too much strain on our appetite. So this is a very important question. Now it turns out, you know, this is the evolutionary tree, which for people in La Costa Glen, I know a lot of people don't hold with, uh, with science here. And if their refrigerator breaks down, they ask their priest to fix it because they hold more with religion than with science. Uh, that's an advertisement for the Atheist Anonymous group. Anyway, it turns out this is the tree of life with evolution here. And all these things at the bottom of the tree, fungus and, uh, and all small bacteria, things like that. Well, I don't know about the bacteria, but the insulin, the fungus, and all the higher things, they also have uh, genes that involve insulin. These are early forms of our own insulin gene. And they share similarities with the humans. I mean, if you mutate the genes that involve this insulin, uh, you can significantly extend life in these species, from yeast to worms to fruit flies and rodents. So one of the papers said, perhaps the fundamental mechanism of aging may be evolutionarily conserved from yeast to mammals. In other words, the basic role of aging may be found in these genes that are insulin type genes that they all share. And uh, I have a funny story to explain why I believe this is true. I was reading the New York Times one day and there was a story saying a priest had discovered that in Africa rice was more robust in times of drought. So I thought this is pretty strange. Why should rice be more robust in times of drought? Well you'd think it would be sicker in times of drought. Rice needs water. So I called up a great expert at Harvard, David Sinclair, the inventor of resveratrol. And I said, uh, is it possible that water, lack of water, drought, is really caloric restriction for rice? Because rice depends on water. So the lack of water may be a kind of caloric restriction. It's lacking nourishment. Of course, it has no calories. Water has no calories. So he said, oh, yes, absolutely. He says, uh, we know that. It's the same gene also in the rice as well as in these animals. And the agricultural companies know it and they're trying to manipulate the gene to make more robust rice, you know, that'll survive better in conditions of drought. So the universality of the biochemistry of man, you know, comes to mind when you think about the way all these things are related. Now there's two other things that low insulin does for you, which further support the idea that maybe it's really low insulin that's at the heart of this. One of them is autophagy and one of them is hormesis. And I have to explain to you what those two things mean. Aut autophagy, uh, uh, auto means self, and phagy means eating in the Greek. Autophagy means self-eating. It's like cannibalism, eating yourself. Now we don't do that. If we get hungry, we use energy from our fat cells. But when life got started on Earth, which was three and a half billion years ago, there were no multicellular org organization, org organisms for three billion years. All the living things for almost all of life on Earth, maybe 80% of life on Earth, were just single cells. They were floating around and they were mutating rapidly and evolving rapidly. They became extremely complex. You wouldn't believe how complex. They're as complex as your computer. And what the biologists have learned about the uh, molecular biology of the cell, when you start looking at it, it's really quite awe-inspiring. So the fundamental question I put to you is this. What did these cells do when there was famine? They didn't have fat cells to draw on. They engaged in self-eating. They found things in the cell that were not necessary, like 
viruses that would penetrate the cell, they had no business being there. Bacteria that had penetrated the cell, they had no business being there. They would try to kill and eat those things. They would find mitochondria that were dead, or maybe they had too many mitochondria, or maybe they had more than they needed, and they would start eating mitochondria. And other parts of the cell that they were in surplus or were uh, uh, broken. They, they ate these things the way the mafia kill people. You know, if you've seen The Sopranos, when the mafia wants to kill somebody, they throw a shroud over his head, and then they take him somewhere where they're going to dispatch him. That's what your cell does. It throws a membrane over the thing it's going to eat. It then moves it to something called a lysosome, which has acid in it, and then it merges the lysosome with this membrane that's got the trapped entity in it, and the acid in the merged two membranes dissolves the thing to be eaten, and when you break the chemical bonds, you get the energy that was in the chemical bonds. And that produces energy, and it breaks the uh, thing to be eaten into uh, the basic parts, like amino acids, and they are used by the cell to construct new parts. So the cell not only gets something to eat, but it gets minted, bright, clean, new mitochondria, and an end to the viruses and bacteria and things like that. So this is a very healthy process, a very healthy process. The problem is that what we've learned is, this is one of the great experts uh, uh, in, um, uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this, um, in autophagy, and she has said that if you skip a meal, your cells start to engage in autophagy. You know, you skip a meal, your cells immediately say famine. Your cells, you see, these are the same cells that were floating around for three billion years, you know. It's just you are a combination of them made into a person with a sort of a skin on top of it, and they're all operating inside. But they are still these single cells. So when they see low insulin, they say, hey, this means low energy, we are starving, something should be done. They start to eat parts of themselves. So, and one of the problems is, that one of the reasons you're all aging, I know you are, you have to admit it, is because this autophagy declines in adults and it's lost in old age. So what's happening in your self is, you are not any longer recycling the cellular garbage. The cellular garbage in all your cells is growing. And it grows like a Matryoshka doll. You, do you know what a Matryoshka doll is? The Russians had these dolls. You took one doll off and there was another doll inside. You take that doll off, there's another doll inside. There'd be seven dolls inside each other. Well, Aubrey de Grey, the great expert on aging who is trying to end aging and let people live forever, he's, he's explained that when your cell loses this ability for autophagy, what happens is this. Your cell finds something that it really should dispose of and eat. So one of three things can go wrong now. The membrane may not entirely enclose it. Or if it does, it moves along. It doesn't find a lysosome with the acid in it. Or it finds the lysosome and merges with it, but the acid isn't strong enough in the lysosome to really dissolve the, uh, the thing to be eaten. So what happens? Well, you have a membrane on top of this cellular garbage and a lysosome attached to it. And the cell recognizes this is not something it wants. So it tries to eat that. So it tries to throw a membrane over that whole thing. But then either the membrane doesn't close or it doesn't find a lysosome or the acid doesn't dissolve it. So then you get another one. So pretty soon you're building this Matryoshka doll of unrecycled garbage. So pretty soon your cells are full of stuff that if you were younger would have been recycled and made into shiny new parts. And that's why I think you're beginning to look old and why you feel old and why your energy is low. This is a major part of aging is the loss of uh, the ability to engage in autophagy. Uh, this expert on autophagy has said that autophagy is linked to certain types of cancer, muscular disorders, metabolic alterations, diabetic syndrome, infectious diseases, neurodegenerative diseases. All of these are well connected to the autophagy process. And Spindler, who wrote the earlier review article, he was the one that said that autophagy declines during adulthood and is almost negligible at older age. Caloric restriction, he said, prevents this age-dependent decline 
In other words, if you're engaged in this caloric restriction in some fashion, you may continue to be able to have this autophagy. And what triggers the autophagy? Well, it was low insulin signaling. So these carb concentration diets, which are signaling, we got low insulin here, cells, we got low insulin, and it's signaling it for 19 hours a day. So this is reminding the cells, you know, eat on your own, you know, do a diet of internal consumption of parts of the cell. The signal is being given off all the time, so that should be helpful. Now, this made a lot of sense to me. This made a lot of sense to me because I had studied fasting in the 1800s before this all got started. I was very interested in fasting. I want to say something about the 1800s. Medicine was so bad in the 1800s that people didn't want to go to doctors. They learned to go to a doctor was more risky than not going to a doctor, so they tried to avoid it. There were two alternative uh, forms of medicine that cropped up to help people who didn't want to go to doctors. And uh, my father wasn't born in the 1800s. He was born in 1907, but he still had that philosophy. He, t he taught me, Jeremy, don't go to doctors unless you're really sick, because you can get sicker going to doctors than not, because you can have misdiagnosis, and then you can have mistherapy. There are a lot of ways that the whole thing can go wrong. And still today, that is a caution, even though the doctors are better. Anyway, in those days, a lot of people went to hemeopathy. These people taught that small, dilute substances could give you a kind of vaccine approach. And at least it wasn't hurt you. It wasn't painful. They weren't bleeding you with leeches and things like that. So homeopathy got a big play with people. But the doctors fought like crazy to keep the homeopaths out of the hospitals. You know, uh, conventional medicine is a jealous god. And the doctors <coughs> don't like competition. So they were fighting to keep the homeopaths out of the hospitals. And another form of alternative medicine cropped up. And that other form of alternative medicine was therapeutic fasting, fasting for therapeutic reasons. And the therapeutic fasters had a lot of successes. They also were fighting with the doctors. One of the most brilliant and able of them, who wrote 40 books on therapeutic fasting, he was a very honorable man. People would come to him and say, oh, doctor, it's very, inter uh, Mr. Uh, it's very interesting what you're doing. Uh, would you write that out so I won't forget your instructions on how to do this fast? So he would write out. And the guy would take this to the police, and he would say, you see, he's practicing medicine without a license. He had been paid to do that. And the police would then arrest the man who was overseeing the fasting and put him in jail for overseeing fasting, which was, as far as the doctors were concerned, practicing medicine without a license because he was making medical claims. So um, it was hard for these doctors, but they had a lot of successes. In those days, people had the time to go on fast, and there weren't a lot of prescription drugs and doctors available. There were some very notable cures. This man was asked, uh, this leading expert was asked, can you cure cancer? He said, no, we can't cure cancer, but we can lower the size of the tumors. We've done that with fast. We've shrunk the size of the tumors. And he said, on one very strong case of Parkinson's, one extreme case of Parkinson's, we actually cured Parkinson's. He said, we had a person on a, uh, uh, on a diet for three weeks, and the Parkinson went down, the rate of Parkinson's, you know, the, the disease moderated. And then we, the person ate, got back to normal health, and then had another three-week fast, and the Parkinson's went down again. And then they did it a third time, and the Parkinson's disease in this person disappeared forever. It went away and stayed away. So they had remarkable successes, and on a lot of things, uh, even today, there's a, there's a few places in the country where you can get advice on fasting. There are very few, but there are a few. And uh, so um, one of the recent papers said that clearing cellular damage by autophagy is a common denominator of many life-extending manipulations. And then he said, the question is, whether drugs or fasting should be promoted as the sole strategy for increasing health and lifespan. He said regular periods of fasting could become a burgeoning trend of modern civilization. And you see, what interested me especially was these people, when you asked them, well, how does this work? You know, you know what's the science behind this? You know, they didn't know, but they had a metaphor. The metaphor was, if you relieve your body of the uh, uh, problem of using energy for digestion, it will use that same energy for repair. Now this wasn't a scientific article. 
argument. It was just a metaphor. They didn't have any way to prove it. But actually, now that you've seen this lecture, you can see how close that was to what the modern experts on autophagy are telling you. They're telling you, when you free your body of eating, you may not be lowering the strain of eating, but you are inducing the cell to do this ultimate cleansing diet. And you're inducing the cell to engage in repair. So the fasting did turn digestion into repair, but they didn't know exactly how. By the 1950s, they did, and they were using the word autolysis, an early word for autophagy. So they, they were on the right track in the 1800s. If people didn't have so much time, if their people aren't, you know, people aren't retired now, they don't go fast for a week because they can't take off that much time. So they don't think in these terms at all, and their doctors certainly don't. But this uh, recent paper, I think, is, is correct. Someday, Fasting, like elderly people may be told someday, fast a day a week. You know, do carb concentration, which is a kind of fast. Because as far as the insulin is concerned, it is a fast for a day because you've got low insulin, except for that four hours during the day. So the, low, the carb concentration diet that I'm preaching is a kind of mini fast during the day. It gives you the low insulin fast, has these cells trying to repair themselves for 19 hours a day. So, the second thing that insulin does, now we're on the track again of is it calories and carbs or is it really the insulin that's induced by the low calories uh, and the low carbs, uh, the high carbs? Is it, is it low insulin and low calories? Low insulin, uh, low insulin also produces healthy stress. There's a phrase you've probably heard, what does not kill me makes me stronger. This phrase is very popular with scientists nowadays because the scientists have learned that the things they used to believe about your eating and your health and impurities in your food are not as clear as you once thought they were. It used to be thought that if you went to, for example, radiation, that the more radiation you had going up this line, more and more radiation, you see more and more exposure. As you went up more and more exposure, you went out this curve, this straight line, you'd have more and more deaths. In other words, the more radiation you got, the worse it was. You had twice as much, it's twice as bad. Three times as much, three times as bad. This has been the thinking for a long time. And so as a result, a lot of people have tried to persuade uh, the country to make sure radiation rates were almost zero, even though it's very expensive to do that or make sure impurities in food are almost zero, which is very expensive to do, even though there are many impurities in the food from the way they grew and the plants around them. So the new theories about things are that hormesis may be the right curve, not the linear hypothesis, that a little bit of the bad thing may cause less deaths. But then when you get to a certain point and you have too much of it, then the deaths start to increase. This is why you see articles saying that children that play in dirt when they're young uh, are less allergic later when they're old. Whereas if the child grows up in a very clean antiseptic atmosphere, you know, he has no exposure. He's not used to this, you see. So the others are, can, are going around saying, it did not kill me and it made me stronger. But they didn't have anything that did not kill them. You see, diet and exercise induce a kind of mild metabolic stress. And this stress induces squadrons of defense molecules that come in to defend the body. And they not only deal with the immediate threat, but it's now believed that they increase resistance to other threats. And they even repair existing damage. So when you do this stress, you see, if you do enough of the stress and not enough so it kills you, you may actually not only uh, deal with the existing stress, but you may repair th the past stress and the body may get into better repair. Well, there's a poem, this, this talk comes with a poem from A.E. Hausman, from a Shropshire lad, about the first person that applied this theory, who lived in 100 BC. He was a king named Mithridates. Is that the way it's pronounced, uh, Mark? Mithridates? Mith Mithridates, Mithridates, I think. His father had been poisoned. The king of this king had been poisoned the father had been poisoned. Poisoning kings was a, a very uh, commonly executed thing in those days. It's a quick way you got rid of kings. 
And so this king, realizing his father had been poisoned, he decided to take all the poisons he could be fined, put them into a little dose together, just a little bit of all of them, and start eating it so that when somebody would poison him, he would be safe because he would be immune to the poison because he had already tried some of it. So he believed in what does not kill me makes me stronger. So A. E. Houseman wrote this wonderful poem. <clears throat> there was a king reigned in the east. There when kings will sit to feast, they get their fill before they think with poisoned meat and poisoned drink. He gathered all the springs to birth from the many venomed earth. First a little, thence to more, he sampled all her killing store. An easy, smiling, seasoned sound sate the king when healths went round. They put arsenic in his meat and stared aghast to watch him eat. They poured strychnine in his cup and shook to see him drink it up. They shook, they stared as whites their shirt. Them it was, their poison hurt. I tell the tale that I heard tell. Mithridates, he died old. And I checked. He lived to 71. So there's a lot to be said for hormesis and autophagy, and both of them are governed by low insulin. And low insulin seems to be what's the common feature in the age-manipulating agents that are used for all these species, because they've tried this on fungus and yeast and every damn thing. And all of them respond well to low calories. But the low calories are inducing low insulin. And in the rice, it isn't even low calories, it's just low water. And that's presumably influencing the same gene. So it really isn't the calories per se. It's triggering the low insulin that does the thing. So in sum, <clears throat> the question that Mark and I are trying to, uh, trying to put before you <clears throat> is, does, does carb concentration eating <clears throat> offer a caloric restriction dividend? In other words, <clears throat> Are you going to get more from this than you got from the Hellers? From the Hellers diet, <coughs> you got a lot of things. Leanness, resistance to metabolic syndrome, help against diabetes, cancer, heart disease, all these things. But can you get even more than they knew? Because they wrote this 20 years ago before autophagy was fully understood. And <coughs> can you get via the low insulin induced and perhaps through an induced reduction in calories? Now there's seven clues, and I want to say something about this induced reduction in calories. I'm, uh, I am 40 pounds lighter than I was at my peak. I lost 30 pounds on the Atkins diet, gained back about half of it, then I lost 25 pounds on the, uh, this con carb concentration eating diet. And, uh, and now I'm well into the healthy range. And one thing that's very clear to me is that when I was eating three meals a day and was obese and then later overweight, I was eating 2,500 calories a day at least. I now seem to be eating like 1,500 calories a day. Because how many calories can you eat in one meal? You know, I eat uh, without counting calories when I go to my main meal. It's either lunch or dinner, depending on whether anybody's invited me to lunch or dinner socially or not or whatever, BJ and I change it. But I eat a full five course meal. That's what they offer here. But there's a limit to how much I can put in my stomach in one meal. And then I'm not hungry at dinner if it's lunch because I've had a big lunch and so I eat a small snack. And in the morning, I don't feel too hungry either because I'm on this low insulin, low carb diet. When I deviate from it, I deviate from it a little but I don't eat a lot more calories. So the calories I'm eating, it, it, it's uh, you know, way below the 2,500. And, uh, and the question is, is it lower than a person with the optimal body mass index? I'm about a body mass index of 23 now, and the optimal is like maybe 22. You're considered healthy between 18 and a half and 25. I'm somewhere near the middle, but I could still lose another five or six pounds. Um, but I'm, um, if I compare what I would normally eat, what I'm eating now, to what this person of body weight 22 is eating, I seem to be eating about 10% calories less than this normal person with the same degree of exercise. This method we're studying uh, counts the exercise. So what we're trying to do 
is to run an experiment to show that people doing this form of the carbohydrate addict's diet, what we call carbohydrate concentration, are going to have a calorie reduction dividend, an appetite mediated reduction in the calories consumed without having to be in a cage where people force it on you, an appetite mediated way that you could be comfortable with and live for a long time with because the whole point of diets is to live for a long time with them. There's no point on a short time in getting off it because the weight will just come back. So what we put before you is the following. Visceral fat, the fat around your abdomen, has been identified as a very important part of the anti-aging uh, effect of caloric restriction. When the caloric restriction removes the fat in your tummy, that helps in the anti-aging effects. This is known. We also know, as I've shown, that carb concentration has the same number of hours of low insulin as the intermittent fasting diet. And the intermittent fasting diet, I've shown, has the same benefits as the caloric restriction diet. So that means by transitivity, mathematicians would say, the caloric concentration diet is having the same effects, uh, uh, should be having some of the same effects as caloric restriction. Furthermore, I learned at this uh, conference of these great experts at the Aging Association that the caloric restriction diet, the way they gave it to the rats, was actually a carb concentration diet because they didn't waste time feeding these rats their small ration, a little bit at breakfast, a little bit at lunch, a little bit at dinner. They said, here, rats, eat it. And the rats, of course, were hungry. They ate it all at once. So 90% of all these experiments we're talking about were not only experiments in low calories, they were experiments in what Mark and I are talking about, carb concentration diets, because a fortiori, they were only eating one meal a day. So they were eating all their carbs in one meal a day. So that's an example, a simple-minded example, of carb concentration. So that's another key that we're on the right track. And as I showed, low insulin appears to be the common denominator of aging in other living things. This seems to be the common denominator of aging, low insulin. And as we've shown, low insulin will trigger autophagy, which is, I've shown, a key process for life extension. And as I've shown, low insulin produces mild metabolic stress and thus hormesis, which is another useful indication that this mild stress will help you induce the benefits that autophagy and stress produce. But to persuade doctors, in order, you see, Mark and I are trying to change the way the world eats, you know, we're not doing this for fun. We're trying to do something about the epidemic of obesity, the epidemic of degenerative disease, and the health budget crisis. So to do that, we've got to have everybody on this diet, not just carb addicts or a few people that are very avant-garde. So in order to do this, we've got to get the doctors to endorse it. The doctors are very conservative. The medical societies are groups of doctors. They're even more conservative than individual doctors. And so we've got to prove it to them in a way they can't avoid. And the way we want to do this is to show that we've got a lot of people. We're trying to find people. Uh, we're setting up our website to try to find people who will try the experiment of doing the carb concentration diet and report to us on how many calories they're actually consuming. Because we want to show that this appetite mediated effect of being on this carb concentrated diet does lower the appetite enough to lower the caloric consumption of these people very considerably and enough to give them some measure of caloric restriction. And so uh, we have on our website uh, a way to get to a very good website for estimating how many calories you eat. It's a very clever website. It makes it very easy. Once you've fed in most of the things that you eat, you can easily document how many calories you're eating. And, uh, uh, and so we're trying to get people, but we've discovered the problem we're facing is that uh, you can put up a website, but, and some people may visit it, but only a fraction of people will actually engage in this experiment. And so we have to have lots of people go to it. And we don't have enough money to advertise to tens of thousands to get a thousand to operate the website. And the main guy on the website so far is a man who turns out to be the wrestling champion of the world. He's very excited about this diet. And he plans to give us an endorsement. His name is Martin Stone, but he's not related to me, I swear to God. He's, he lives in Britain. Um, so now how much benefit would you get from the kind of calorie dividend 
then Mark and I are talking about it. Are you going to live 30% longer, for example, like the rats? Well, I regret to report, not that much. It, um, so uh, I'm going to estimate this in a moment. Oh, so I just, uh, what I just explained was why I think carb concentration seems the most practical way to leanness and the best bet for healthy aging. The reason it's the most practical way to leanness is that first of all, this is an ecumenical diet. Any diet can be done this way. We're not asking anybody in the world to change their diet. You can be on a low fat diet, a high sugar diet, a low sugar diet. You know, you can be a vegan, you can be a vegetarian, you can be whatever you want. And so long as you concentrate your carbs in one of the three meals, you're okay with us. So first of all, this diet is good for getting people to do it because it doesn't require them to change their diet. In fact, we stopped calling this a diet. We're trying to remember to call it a way of eating. You can eat your diet on this way of eating, whatever the diet is. That's the first thing. And second, this is a proven practicality because it sold five million books under the name Carbohydrate Addicts Diet. And it's also practical because it's mediated by appetite. We're not asking people to starve themselves. I am not starving myself. I'm doing this in a very natural way and that's why I can continue it. And also, it permits violations. You know, the Atkins diet in its first stage, you get into ketosis after 36 hours. And if you eat one carb over the 20 gram limit, you know, you're popped out of ketosis and it'll take you 36 hours to get back into it. So it's an unstable diet with regard to violations. And Atkins tells you, don't violate this diet. So in the first stage of that diet, in the first month when you're on very low carbs, you've got to stick to that in a very strict way, which is one of the reasons I didn't want to go back to it. But on this diet, it's not that way. I mean, if I eat three meals one day and eat carbs in all of them, uh, that just sets back some of these parameters a little bit. And I may gain some weight. I'll gain some water weight because more carbs gives more insulin and more insulin means more, more water retention. So the next day you'll weigh a little more and you'll think you gain weight, but it's really some more water. You don't have to worry about it too much. You don't have to do this diet all the time. On holidays, you could skip it. You know, I give you freedom to violate this diet. The important thing is to stick with it for a, a long time. So that's the practical part. As far as the effective part is, as I mentioned, the leanness is most of healthy aging. And it'll help with hypertension, heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, dementia, many types of cancers. And the six clues that I described seem likely to help with aging and other degenerative diseases. So there's a lot to say for this disease. If only we can prove that it, I mean, I'm with it already. This, from my point of view, this diet is quite satisfactorily established, short of the kind of proof that you never get with diets in humans because human diets would require hundreds of years to get a lot of people to live their lifetime, watch very closely, and still people would say you didn't run the experiment right. My, my wife worked in epidemiology at the National Cancer Institute for 36 years, and I don't think they've ever done a study she can't find some flaw in. You know. So it's very hard to do this through studies. There has to be a certain amount of plausibility. This is very plausible and very practical, but we need to sell it is an experiment to show that people are eating a lot less calories on this. Now, how many less calories? Well, Mark pointed out that the Okinawans, who are known for longevity, uh, they have changed their diet in recent years. But the older Okinawans, they lived on a very low calorie diet for half their life. Now, we know from the rat experiments that the benefits of caloric restriction on the rats depended on how long were the rats on it, you know, was it half their lifetime or all their lifetime or the last quarter of their lifetime. It was proportional to how long they were on it. And it was also proportional to how deep was the caloric restriction. Was it 10%, 20%, 30%, 50%? After 50%, they died. So these were the two things that the benefits were proportionate to. And Mark pointed out that the Okinawans are living about five years longer, these elderly ones, on half a lifetime, on half a lifetime of, uh, of restriction in calories of about 30%. Uh, how much? It was closer to 10%. Closer to 10%. So anyway, so we did a calculation. 
I'm 75. If I'm, in fact, eating 10% less calories, and I do this for 15 more years, <coughs> according to Mark's analysis, I would gain a year or two of longevity. Now, I know a lot of you put up your nose at longevity, and a lot of you say, I don't want to live forever. I don't want to live any longer. But it comes with healthy aging, you know. So it's putting off diseases. It's lower morbidity. It means when you do collapse, you'll be frail and collapsed over a much shorter period. It's what's called sort of rectangularization. Women often are approaching a one-horse shea approach where they live without suicides or accidents or much else. They live till they're about 85, and then they die of every damn thing because one thing goes wrong and everything else goes wrong. They die like a one-horse shea. You know, this is considered an optimal way to do it because you're in good health for a long time and then die quickly. And uh, so when we talk about this uh, diet benefiting a year or two, we don't mean just benefiting a year or two. The healthy aging benefit and the short morbidity is a very fundamental thing. So in conclusion, we're trying to sell all these people at as early a possible age as possible, not just you guys, but your children and your grandchildren, uh, to concentrate your carbs once a day. Don't eat soda pop at all opportunities, you know, these very sugary drinks. If you want some Pepsi-Cola, okay, at one of your meals, but not three times a day. And if you want to eat pancakes, okay, but not three times a day. And if you want to eat bread and potatoes, okay, but not three times a day. Concentrate these sweet, sugary things that we all love so much in just one of your meals. You won't find it very hard. The most carbohydrate-addicted people found they could live with a reward meal and two accessory meals. That's the way the Hellers described it. So your children and your grandchildren can do it too. And if they don't lose that weight, they are going to be in terrible condition when they get old. It's very hard to treat diabetes. And it's very hard to treat Alzheimer's. You can't treat it at all. I mean, if you could put off, if you could put off Alzheimer's for five years, you would, um, you would cut the number of people with Alzheimer's in half because the people would die of something else. That would already be a great benefit. And obesity is, of course, as I mentioned, very expensive. The rates of obesity now have doubled in the last three decades. It used to be 5% for men and 8% for women in 1980. Now it's 10% for men and 14% for women. I want to tell you how this all came about before I close because it's a very important story. Two people, one I hate and one I love, caused this whole epidemic of obesity. And I want to tell you why I think it happened, because I believe the analysis of Gary Taubes in the article that saved me 30 pounds, what if it's all a big fat lie? You see, what I forgot to tell you was that when Banting went on the Banting diet, I told you the textbook said, if you wanted to lose weight, eat protein. But what I didn't tell you was that in the 60s, this whole idea, which the doctors had accepted, was turned on its head by a man who did a study that was flawed about six or seven countries. He concluded with a superficial examination that it was fat that caused fat, not sugar that caused fat. In some of these countries, they had a completely different kind of diet, so this, this whole analysis didn't really apply. In others, he played down the role of sugar. This man had invented the K-ration in World War II, so he had great, his name was Ansel Keys, he had a great prestige. And in the medical profession, it's run like an army, you know, the generals decide and all the, so the doctors do what they're told. They don't have time to study all the studies. So this man said, I've done this study, and it shows that fat is what's causing fat, and we need to go on a low-fat diet. Now, by itself, this would not have changed everybody's mind. But Senator McGovern had a health subcommittee, and the health subcommittee decided to have hearings on hunger and obesity, and the staff of the subcommittee said to the scientists, we know you don't know everything. Good God, we don't expect you to know everything. But um, give it your best shot. Tell us what you think. So a lot of these scientists got up and said, well, we like this low-fat diet. One man named Handler was the president of the National Academy of Sciences. As some of you know from other lectures I've given, he and I fought like cats and dogs because we were rival scientific societies. I was president of the Federation of American Scientists, and he was president of the National Academy of Sciences. And he thought we were a second voice of science, and there should only be one. 
But in any case, he said something very brilliant when he testified, I had to admit. He was a biochemist. He knew this subject. He said to the committee, you were doing an experiment on all Americans and you don't have sufficient information to do it and you don't know what the result will be. And he was right. The food manufacturers said, hey, they seem to want a little fat diet. The McGovern committee, I loved McGovern, but the committee came out with this conclusion. Let's go with a low fat diet. Well, the food manufacturers said, great. You know, the food manufacturers are best at selling food that's manufactured. They don't do so well at fresh food because they don't have a profit margin on this. So they said, hey, low fat foods, we'll produce low fat foods. But they knew one thing that the McGovern committee had not realized. That if food doesn't have fat in it and it doesn't have sugar in it, then it doesn't have the two things people like to eat. And if it doesn't have either of them, it'll taste like hell. So as a result, they start putting sugar in the low fat foods. So if you go down those low fat diet aisles where you think you're benefiting, and you look at the low fat mayonnaise, look at the low fat this and the low fat this, you look at it carefully, you'll see it's got a lot of sugar in it. So what happened was you were put on a diet, I mean many of you, and you were told, this low-fat diet will reduce your weight. In fact, you were put on secretly a diet that would increase your weight because you got the carbs, and it was the carbs that were increasing your weight. And then when you didn't lose weight, they blamed you. They said, well, you, 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 know, you were eating too many calories, and you eat like a pig, or some other complaint. And they said, uh, you should diet more, and you should exercise more. And all the food pundits said over and over, people are not exercising enough. That must be it, because we're sure we're right about this diet. But none of these food pundits had studied this diet. They're not scientists. They repeat whatever they're told. So this whole thing got started on the low-fat diet. And this started this epidemic of obesity. And when these people get fat, they go to these stores where you can buy Big Macs and drinks. And they want big drinks and they want Big Macs because they're used to having a lot of blood sugar. And when it crashes, they get hungry. And they say, I need another Pepsi. Give me one of those big Pepsis. And they start drinking bigger and bigger Pepsis and bigger and bigger Macs. And then a lot of people blamed them. They said, why are these food manufacturers selling, you know, big sugar drinks? And you know, why don't they sell smaller ones? That was like telling car manufacturers, why don't you sell Volkswagens instead of these, uh, you know, uh, large uh, vehicles? Because, but the f car people were saying that's what they want. And so that's why we sell them. So people's desire, their appetites, drove this budget, drove this uh, diet, encouraged people to sell them more food than they wanted, encouraged them to put out food with a lot of sugar in it, and started an epidemic of obesity that will take decades to end. And the one thing that is clear is, you cannot end it by telling people, you eat like a pig, you gotta eat less, because they have an appetite and they're hungry. And if you don't control the appetite, you can't complain when after a while their will breaks and they go back to eating in their normal fashion. So all those people that said, well, it's a calorie in and a calorie out. I've heard that maybe a billion times from food pundits. Just got to eat less calories and you just got to exercise more. If you boil down every article by every pundit, that's all it says. You got to exercise more and you got to eat less. And they all quote the uh, first law of thermodynamics and, you know, it's all energy in and energy out. The Hellers were much smarter. They said a lot of people eat very little and gain a lot of weight. And a lot of people eat a lot and don't gain weight. They could see. I mean, they had clinical experience. They saw. These abstract theories were not right. And exercise has been advertised now for decades. People have been going to these health thing, gyms and all that, and nothing has changed. So <coughs> that's our pitch. We think we can change it with this diet. If we can get enough people together to show that on this diet people eat less in a way that they're comfortable with. And if we can do that uh, somehow, which we haven't quite figured out how to do to get all those people together, uh, then uh, we think we can sell it to the medical societies. In the meantime, we're going to be giving this talk at other places where there are scientists and defending our position and putting this talk up on the web where people can see it. Uh, some of you know I have a website called catalyticdiplomacy.org for my foreign policy work. And, but this one's put on a different website, it's called Catalytic Longevity. I have to tell you, if this works, I'll be remembered, I don't know about Mark, Mark and I will be remembered for this, not for, and I won't be remembered more for the foreign policy work, because this is really big and really important. You simply can't solve these crises 
by telling people to eat less and exercise more. Well, thank you very much for coming, especially after dinner. Thank you.